I want to thank you all for joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're where you're located. My name is uh, Meredith Malone. I'm associate curator at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. And I have the pleasure of introducing our two speakers today, uh, Constance Vale and Chantel Blakely, who are both assistant professors of architecture in the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University. Uh, this discussion is organized on the occasion of the opening of the new teaching gallery exhibition that Constance curated, titled The Autonomous Future of Mobility. Now, Constance's project examines the car's legacy over the past century, predominantly in the United States, as depicted in art and in visual culture. The exhibition opened at the Kemper just last week on November 2nd um, to the university community. And it also exists virtually in the form of an online exhibition. Um, I will put the URL for that in the chat in case you weren't, hadn't seen it yet. You should definitely, there you go. You can check that out. Uh, the teaching gallery is an exhibition space in the lower level of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum that is dedicated to exhibiting works from the museum's collection with direct connections to Washington University courses. The teaching gallery exhibitions are intended to serve as parallel classrooms and they can be used to supplement courses through object-based inquiry, research, and learning. And I wanna thank you, Constance, for your flexibility over these many months as we navigated the ups and downs of making an exhibition uh, during this very uncertain and ongoing pandemic. So it's really been a pleasure to work with you and congratulations on the show. Constance Vale is a licensed architect and a director of the Factory of Smoke and Mirrors, an experimental research practice that undertakes investigations in the territory between architecture, art, theater, and technology. She's an assistant professor of architecture at WashU, and she's previously taught at SCI ARC and the University of California, Los Angeles. She's the recipient of the 2020 Emerson Excellence in Teaching Award. Vale's work has been exhibited at the a and Museum and published in the Journal of the American Institute of Architects, the Los Angeles Times, Archinect, and CLOG, C-L-O-G. Vale is currently collaborating with WashU Professor of Computer Science, Dr. Eugene Vorobechek on the architectural design of a testing platform for autonomous driving. Constance, please correct me if I've butchered his last name. Oh, you did excellent, I think. <laughs> okay. In 2019, she organized the event Decoys and Depictions, Images of the Digital, a symposium and a set of three exhibitions. In 2015, Vale collaborated with Emmett Zeifman to complete a temporary pavilion in downtown Los Angeles for Yuval Sharon's experimental opera, Hopscotch. She's co-author and editor of the forthcoming Graham Foundation supported book, Mute Icons and Other Dichotomies of the Real in Architecture with Marcello Spina and Georgina Holjic. Vale earned her MARC from Yale School of Architecture where she received the Moulton Andrus Award for Excellence in Art and Architecture and two Feldman nominations and a BFA from Parsons School of Design. She has a practice in internationally recognized offices in Los Angeles, New York City, and her hometown of Pittsburgh. Chantal Blakely is an architectural historian with additional experience in architecture practice and philosophy. Her current projects include a series of essays on the poet critic Herbert Reed, a study of the Italian post-war architect Marco Zanuso, and a monograph of the architect Charles E. Fleming, Washington University's first African-American graduate in architecture. Dr. Blakely's essays and translations on architecture have appeared in Domus, AA Files, Avery Review, Plot, and other journals. Prior to joining the faculty at the Sam Fox School, she was public programs manager at Harvard Graduate School of Design, where she co-curated the exhibition Happening Now, Historiography in the Making in 2016. She also organized numerous lectures and conferences. She holds a PhD in the history and theory of architecture from Columbia University, an MARC from Princeton University, and an MA in philosophy from Tufts University. Again, it's my pleasure to welcome you both here today. Thank you for what will likely be a very um, an interesting conversation. I wanna say to all of you who are in attendance, um, we would love it to hear from you as well. So if you have questions for Constance or Chantel, if you please use the Q&A feature on Zoom at the bottom of your screen, um, they will, we will, be taking questions um, intermittently throughout their, their conversation. So without further ado, I'll give it to you, Constance and Chantel. Thank you, Meredith. Um, and thank you to the Kemper for uh, inviting us to speak today. Thank you especially to you, Meredith, um, and to Kim Brooker, 
Sabine Ekman, Jane Niederhart, and Holly Tasker for uh, making this exhibition possible. Um, it's, you know, outstanding that it's been able to be mounted. And I hope that some of the guests that are joining today will be able to see it in the museum and also visit the match show, which I uh, just walked through on my last stop into the museum and, and thought was absolutely fantastic um, and a must see. So I recommend, you know, the museum will even, they love to hear from you and, and have you come in uh, at a sort of planned schedule, but they also take walk-ins. Um, so make, make a point to get a little time in the Kemper if you can. Um, it's a real treat in the midst of being able to go so few places uh, and it's, it's very safe there from what I've experienced. So I just do want to point out, we are only open to the university right. community because of the pandemic. So this is again, why it's so wonderful to have your exhibition both in person, um, but also online for you know more of the general public can appreciate it. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to uh, start by saying just a couple words about the exhibition. I'm going to screen share um, a PowerPoint so that we can see some of the artworks real quickly that might come up in the conversation today. Uh, so here, here we have um, the, the title, of course, The Autonomous Future of Mobility, and the exhibition really pins around uh, six categories, one of which is car culture, and, and you can walk through them in a sort of linear order um, to expand the story of uh, how cars and uh, infrastructure have had an impact on the built environment, um, and car culture really centering around this kind of um, nostalgia of, of the vehicular environment where you can think of diners, um, you know, the kinds of things that that uh, populate um, the cities and, and vast stretches of highway um, drive-ins, uh, uh, NASCAR <laughs> as, as a kind of part of this, so hot rodding. So we can think of the development of uh, a real culture around the car starting in the 1950s, um, and, and the kinds of documentations that uh, happened in art around that. And also things like the Great American Road Trip. Um, actually in teaching the studio, I uh, opened with the students. There's a parallel studio coordinated with the exhibition sharing the same title. Um, and the first thing that we talked about at the beginning of the semester, I said, "Somebody, everybody tell me a story um, about a car, like an experience that you've had on the road or in a car. Um, and I think the vast majority of them were road trips. Um, so an ongoing tradition of uh, car culture um, and looking at Jennifer, uh, James Jennifer Georgina by Irma Boom, uh, this book that has a compendium of postcards written by Jennifer um, while she was on the road with, with James um, and away from Georgina, her daughter, James, her husband. Uh, and, and the complexities that emerge um, from that. And in fact, there's a, a great website um, of that work. Uh, so if you can't be in the gallery, and even if you can, it's a little, it's impossible to pan through the pages, but the website is a great resource to be able to see some of that content. Um, signs being the second category uh, in the exhibition, looking at the work of Warhol, commercial artist, um, who of course does this uh, print of truck uh, where we're dealing with a kind of hypergraphic, gigantic uh, moving billboard, the truck itself, um, and the sort of language that uh, Warhol uses in his work that plays well with that, that actually the two are very much interconnected. Um, Ruscha and every building on the Sunset Strip where we get the uh, full length of all of these the ephemera um, and signage that appear on the strip, each uh, sort of unfolded, actually recorded from a truck that had two cameras facing out of it. So like a proto early version of um, the kind of machine vision apparatuses that we see now with multi-camera attachments where he's capturing uh, everything that his vehicle is passing. Um, and of course the colophon fold out um, of the the uh, book that is, of course, like very, uh, you know, made for mass production and really plays into that same kind of um, language that we see in the built environment. Um, 
Noel Mahaffey's Nighttime Square, uh, and in this case, again, signage, but um, in New York City. So we can see LA, very important uh, to car culture, um, and, and as well, New York Times Square. Um, and the story there, of course, around the time of this uh, image was that that street was not quite the commercial enterprise that it is today um, and was one of the most dangerous areas uh, in the city of New York. Um, and in fact, uh, car culture contributes um, to that. The fact that highways uh, are being added into uh, cities and, and uh, pulling people out to the suburbs actually um, leaves the city bereft of some kinds of income um, uh, and, and sort of produces some of these uh, problems um, in internal to cities. Uh, the vehicular landscape, so street photography, which really emerges um, as a way to document what's going on on the streets. Um, and so we can see the pedestrian realm uh, that's connected to that vehicular realm um, as quite important to what's going on around the emergence of um, a, a really concentrated, dense uh, street culture in cities like New York and LA, again, in, in these two photographs. Um, 34 parking lots by Ruscha gives us this index of all the typologies of parking lots caught uh, by a photographer that was being directed by Ruscha um, and really starting to, well in a city, uh, capture some of the suburbanizing effects on that city um, of the car's implementation and, and the requirements, this like sublime scale um, requirement to house these vehicles in cities. Uh, and of course, autonomous vehicles will play into all of this. Um, so we can think about that as, as somewhat resistant to change because of its scale. Um, we can also think of it as something that could in uh, the future be mitigated, that in fact, um, it's, it's not perhaps as necessary to have vast amount of parkings if, if dealing with something like ride sharing of autonomous vehicles. Um, Energy, Ruscha's documentation of 26 gasoline stations, um, these prototypical stations um, along between uh, Texas and uh, California. Um, and then Larry Stark's uh, ENCO, where we're seeing um, a now long gone uh, gas, gasoline company um, present in the merger of uh, Exxon, Esso, I think there was a third one. Um, and in fact, seeing that layered in with uh, industry and nature um, and the kind of uh, ecological impacts that the car has wrought being sort of in the background of that image. Um, Ron Kleeman's gas line, where uh, we see the impact of um, shortages, uh, the sort of global nature of, of energy um, that is needed to fuel cars um, and how that has uh, major effects, not only on, on the availability of those resources, but also um, their political, you know, making, making sort of power structures uh, in a global economy um, that are very contentious and, and produce uh, oftentimes even uh, wars or other uh, military conflicts. Um, and then speed, uh, the desire for speed that dominates um, things like auto racing, uh, which are contingent on the sort of danger and risk involved. Um, we can even preview some of Theory Eyes right here, uh, Doug Aiken's film, uh, which is present in the gallery. Um, and in fact, uh, Royal Road Test uh, pushing, pushing a typewriter out of a vehicle. So seeing the damaging impact of speed or the, the desire uh, to go at high speeds <clears throat> present in those works. Um, and then John Chamberlain's Hanging Herm, where we can see the sort of flexibility and uh, um, superficiality of, of the car surface, the fact that it is very malleable. Um, Ar Arnold Odormat, who's a photographer that captures uh, police scenes. Um, so we can actually see cases, and this is a European work, uh, the only one in the exhibition. We can see 
um, the actual scenes of, of various accidents um, several hours after the accident has taken place or even uh, a, day, a day or two, um, but not, not necessarily seeing the direct incident, the aftermath rather, of, of the accident. Um, and then autonomous mobility, um, these things which have the ability to sort of move and act on space um, without having uh, sort of operator, um, but rather having information guiding their movement. So uh, Breer's float, which is actually um, not, uh, not in the sense uh, an autonomous uh, vehicle, but nevertheless uh, moves about a space, the space of the gallery um, on its own. There's a video recording in the exhibition uh, where you can get a sense the speed is actually very, very slow. Um, and so resisting the kind of modernist impulse for efficiency uh, and speed. Um, and Trevor Peglin's Reaper drone, uh, which of course is a tiny, tiny dot in this uh, otherwise idyllic uh, image of a sunrise, I believe it is. Um, and so we see, you know, the, the drone as, as this like tiny uh, object, despite its um, vast presence in, in media. Um, and uh, Piglin, considering some of what the consequences of these uh, Reaper drones would would be or are in the in the contemporary world that in fact um, they're used for you know military uh, further military entanglements that uh, they're policing in covert uh, covert ways um, and surveilling uh, ultimately um, and this gets into more of Peglin's uh, discourse around surveillance and images. Um, the fact that surveillance is able to take place on such large scales today um, due to the fact that machines in can, can uh, both capture um, and sort and retain information from images um, at a scale that we've never seen in history. Um, so that covers the kind of breadth of what's in the show and hopefully we'll pin around that in some of the conversation. Um, I. I am looking forward to talking to Chantel. Thank you, Chantel, for coming to speak with me today. Um, and with that, let's discuss. Okay, well, thank you, Constance, for inviting me. And thank you, Meredith, for the lovely introduction. Um, so the first thing that strikes me about the exhibition, Constance, is this like passion you have for the subject matter. And so I guess my first question is, how did you come to be interested in autonomous mobility? What led you to that? Sure. So um, as Meredith mentioned in her introduction, I'm working on a project with Dr. Eugene Borbichik, who's in the McKelvey School of in Engineering here at WashU in computer science. Um, he actually approached with a kind of vague, like a clear idea of the project that he wanted to work on, but not really sure who to talk to. Um, and and uh, I got connected with him through Heather Wifter and was so excited to um, work on this project with him. So uh, it's for a model, scale model um, of an autonomous testing, autonomous vehicle testing platform, um, and ultimately designing the, the kind of city uh, that that vehicle can relate to. Um, and so the part, part and parcel of, of undertaking this is improving upon the safety of autonomous vehicles. That's really uh, Eugene's objective. Um, and that you know, is one of the core principles of architecture. That is the first definition of the architect in legal terms. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think where, where architecture can really contribute to autonomous vehicles beyond helping uh, others to research and facilitate the safety of those vehicles um, is to think about how they really plug into a spatial network. So how cities uh, and architecture can respond to those, um, really dealing with the problems that cars have wrought for a long time um, and thinking about how uh, given these new properties um, of autonomous vehicles, they're not gonna solve, you know, we see them as, oh, they could come in and have uh, the ability to decrease emissions uh, through ride sharing. That's 
like a latent potential. And yet the other hand, on the other hand, we can see an equal potential for them to increase emissions because everybody still, let's say, retains uh, an individual car. And this also would potentially increase congestion. Uh, everybody owns still their individual car and they sometimes take ride sharing fleets and those cars in the ride sharing fleets never park. So they're constantly driving around. So there's, there's the possibility that it would only inflate and, uh, and exacerbate existing problems with vehicles. So in thinking about how we can sort of create opportunities for people to think of how those autonomous vehicles connect to say mass transit, we open up possibilities for, oh yeah, then, then mass transit, which is perhaps uh, more difficult for some to access now, they would have a way to get there through access to an autonomous vehicle in a fleet uh, that then connects them to several other means of transit. Um, and that's something that Keller Easterling posits in her essay, Switch, um, which we've read in the studio and been thinking uh, quite a bit about. Um, so in, in the problems, like we can think of um, Paul Virilio's uh, quote that the, the invention of the car is also the invention of the car accident. Any new technology presents all kinds of opportunities, but it also presents all set, a whole set of new problems. Um, and as an architect, I'm always uh, excited to think about what those problems are and how we can tune uh, space and uh, think about confronting them and, and with a kind of degree of futurity, like projecting well into the future, uh, because of course, technology moves much faster than uh, the scale of infrastructure is, is able to keep up with. So how can we think way out ahead of the technology um, or anticipate some of the problems that it might create through speculations um, and, and start to uh, deal, deal with those problems in advance to some extent. Um, the other uh, aspect of this project that's really interesting to me are, um, is the scenographic aspect of it. So the car is always in a landscape. We see the landscape that produ is produced around it in these artists' images in the exhibition. Um, and to think about how to construct that in an architectural model at one to eight scale is a significant scale. A building is at least as tall as you or I, if not taller. Um, and, uh, and really working within images, which are something that I think about uh, quite a bit. So the scenographic image um, producing this kind of set uh, for the autonomous vehicle to perceive in, right? So we're used to thinking about scenography really as for, uh, as for people uh, to produce a kind of image for us to see, see a certain uh, atmosphere world in. Um, but in fact, machines have the capability to, we, we talk about it as seeing, you could talk about it as sensing, actually navigation becomes an important term, thinking about how, um, how this kind of data-driven input uh, and, and encoding of information, decoding of that information by machines might have impacts on, on uh, both how we represent an architecture, how we build an architecture, um, and how we might shape the built environment differently, or think about signage differently, or think about um, you know, the, the street itself and how it's arrayed differently based on the fact that uh, the car is an actor and has a totally different kind of perception, but one which also um, now has, has a significant impact uh, on, on that environment. I, I, think, I think there's some, some there there. So anyways, that was a very long answer, uh, but wheeled through, I think, I think well, many yeah. of my interests. <laughs> yeah, okay, yes, I, you answered very thoroughly for sure. Um, one thing that strikes me though, is that you um, have adopted, uh, let's say historically speaking in terms of modern architecture and after architects have taken and a variety of attitudes toward sort of change in technology and how we live, but broadly speaking, they can be divided into, on the one hand, the sort of responsible and pragmatic 
and on the other hand, the sort of celebratory and ludic and futuristic. And it strikes me that you're actually um, very deeply, your mind is very deeply sort of infiltrated and imbricated in the, the responsibility side. Um, and as you say that you talk about the problems of the car, I have to confess that although I don't actually own a car, I get around by a bicycle, I actually love cars, I love to drive. And if someone tells me that cars have ruined cities, I start to feel like I'm shrinking inside. Um, and the theme of autonomy actually makes me think of like these wide open, like highwayscapes of like Paris, Texas, or the flying cars in the Jetsons, um, these sort of images of like, or, you know, like the paintings of Richard Hamilton, like all the images of the, that celebrated the car. Um, <clears throat> so I'm listening to you with a certain amount of ambivalence when dwelling on the idea of the problems of the car. Um, that's, that's very there's so much to deal with there. Hmm? That's very fair. Yeah, cars are amazing. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think, let's see, so, I do, I love cars, right? Like I, there's no way you'd happen into this project and want to work with, with toy cars on a scale model if you didn't like cars. Um, so in, in the, I have trepidation about, uh, I guess I'm, I'm a pro technologist. Like I, I am very much not, not, resistant to the developments that we're seeing coming at us um, at great speed. I am only an advocate that architects should play a role, urban designers, engineers should play a role in how they are uh, implemented, that we need to be active participants in that conversation and not beyond, you know, us, we need to open that conversation to, um, you know, wider spectrums of, of the population, like we should be people that are uh, talking to communities and trying to understand like, where does everybody sit on this? You know, there's a lot of um, antipathy towards autonomous vehicles right now. People are throwing rocks at them or shooting at them um, as, as a kind of uh, condition of the few places that they are now in wide circulation. Uh, I was reading a New York Times article on it. Um, and so, there's some sort of building of trust that needs to be done in the in in wider culture, and and that's a lot of a part of how uh, Eugene thinks about the project. How do how do we get people to trust autonomous vehicles? And I I along with him follow that this is an important aspect of the project, and in fact think of uh, the things that we're working on as building that trust um, through a kind of public reception. Like if we are to make this project that we're working on an exhibition uh, as well, you know, then then we're opening that conversation. And certainly through this conversation occurring now and with the Kemper, um, I hope that people are thinking into this and thinking about, you know, how governments and corporations and like will play a major role in how autonomous vehicles come come to life in the world and certainly have in across the life of the car. Um, you know, they they have historically, you know, think about any car commercial you've ever seen um, and, and the sort of picture that's produced in it. Um, and it's sort of handed, handed to us without any kind of uh, concern. Um, and I think at the same time, you know, we need to be critical uh, of, of what we're handed um, and think about how we can frame it uh, in the most productive way um, as citizens and as architects, uh, designers, and engineers. I think um, what you just said actually touches on what some might call the role for art um, in this whole problem, uh, which is a kind of public relations. Um, to some extent, those artworks or the, the cartoons and films that I mentioned um, are like bullet, you know, like films with cars or even like chitty chitty bang bang um i'm sort of dating myself but um films or like herbie the love bug like films and television and cartoons and all these kinds of popular art forms really celebrated the car and helped people to get ex excited maintain excitement about cars um i think it's fair to say that america is a car obsessed 
um, country. And I suspect that um, the right kind of imagery around autonomous vehicles and autonomous mobility could play a role in shifting public opinion, even apart from the safety issues. I think even as we've seen in recent political events, safety is, you know, we assume people are, are deeply concerned about safety, but, you know, when you're dealing with human beings, there's always a certain contingency involved. And so, you know, people weigh one thing or another, maybe their passion for, you know, excitement overcomes their fear of danger. Um, so I'm not too worried about autonomous vehicles not being sort of taken up and, and exciting the public. Um, once they become a sort of more widespread reality, and especially if they fly. <laughs> if they fly, actually, some of your concerns about parking might be taken care of because then there would be sort of vertical parking, right? Um, so. I mean, well, I, yes, yes, yes and no. I would be totally down for a flying car, um, <laughs> but you know they would make a whole host of new problems. <laughs> Always looking at the downside of things, Constance. Just imagine the exhilaration of flying through the air without doing, you could look up from your magazine or surfing the internet just to take a peek at the, the, at the scenery. <laughs> yes, yes, fair, fair. Well, uh, I mean, responsibility is like one of those deep themes of, of modern architecture. So it's not, I'm not, I don't want to dissuade you from, from being responsible, but. Um, you know, in a way, I think cars are already autonomous vehicles, aren't they? Well, I think, I mean, in, uh, in their current, like, if you get a regular, a standard order uh, car, um, you're really dealing with an appendage, right? A thing that is uh, only at the service of the user driver writer, right? Like there really has to be a way to activate um, a, a standard car, uh, whereas the autonomous vehicle, and, and the word autonomy is a bit odd um, around autonomous vehicles, uh, but they are certainly much more actors on their own. Um, they are, you know, compelled through a set of instructions, through vast data sets, uh, through um, reactions to the environment to, to move and act in the world. Um, but they're, they're never, they're never fully autonomous. You're right to a certain extent. I like your question, um, that they're at, at once, we, we really will have a more collaborative relationship with them, let's say, uh, than we, we do with cars. There's very little input from the the car itself in a standard car whereas an av has the ability to sort of talk back to a certain extent um and i think we can we can consider i don't know i'm thinking of uh james brittle's um autonomous trap uh and which appears in the essay uh let me think can i remember the failing to see the difference between uh tractor trailer in a bright white sky and, and talks about a, a series of uh, accidents, um, both from a very early sort of autonomous vehicle experiment, which, you know, way precedes uh, the autonomous vehicles that we think about now. Um, and then of course the, the tractor trailer crash, but his autonomous uh, trap is actually produced uh, by a, a white continuous white line and a dashed white line and the car can drive into it, but can't get out of it. Um, so in a way, <laughs> Bertel plays a game with the car um, and, and sets up this dialogue between the painter of the, of the street signage and the car itself. Um, and so I, I think we can, we can think of them as, as playmates on, on the road or um, as, as, I don't know, as more uh, active participants in, in the sort of driving and being um, in, in, on the road. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think there's, they have, they have a little more agency 
um, as objects. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. Um, I just want to follow up um, on something else that you said. Uh, it, it's your, you've painted a picture of the architect's role as being sort of how to help solve, address the problems of, um, of autonomous mobility. And uh, just, I'm just thinking about how, from a certain point of view of, let's say, Marxist architecture criticism of the 1970s, uh, the analysis, how the analysis might go from that point of view. So the argument advanced by Manfredo Tafuri, among his many arguments, was that, that in some sense, art and architecture was the sort of helpmate of the expansion of capitalist sort of speculation and, and, and exploitation by making it seem okay and attractive. And one of the examples he gives is um, the artwork F-111, which is based on um, like an airplane. It's like a multi-panel artwork of an airplane. And it's sort of like about an older airplane and it's sort of recovering recovering this obsolescent thing and turning it into an artwork where then it, it has this new value. So it seems to me that along those lines, a critic who thought along similar lines might say that if an architect is sort of consigned to simply be the interpreter and helpmate of autonomous mobility, then that is not autonomy for the architect. That is actually the architect becoming sort of subservient. So I guess my question to you might be like, do you agree or is that something that you're worried about? And, 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 and to what extent do you perceive like, where do you see the autonomy of the architect entering in? Or where do you see an opening for an architect to be autonomous and address autonomous mobility? Wow, good question. Um, I think, so, yeah, I think the term autonomy is so complex in architecture that I, it's not slipping by me, but I, I love the analysis that you've presented. I wonder, um, I think the, my, my thinking about autonomous vehicles uh, slips into multiple planes. So there's the um, social and political, you know, narrative of, hey, these, these things will be implemented. How, how do we sort of, I, I think some of it is how do we facilitate, you know, safer conditions, whatever, that's, that's pretty, but also how do we trip up the capitalist motivations uh, that that fall in with that. Um, you know, you can you can sort of ally with them in order to uh, create better frameworks that will um, mis misalign their intents, like sort of upset what the intentions of um, let's say the you know, whoever's Waymo or uh, whoever's yeah. running the autonomous vehicle fleet, you know, their primary motivation is let's, let's make some money on this. Um, of course. Right. Uh, um, they can couch that in let's make it safer and, and everything as well. Um, and as the architect, I, I don't think you're right. I don't think we should be in service of, of Waymo, but rather in, in service of the broader public and thinking um, about how to serve, you know, the interests of of the populace, not not those corporate entities. Now, how those get entangled is is a, another question. And then, secondly, I think um, geometry, form, and space, and you know, material and and architectural detail, like all of that, is also interesting uh, to me. Like space as as this incredible thing that it is. Um, so as much as I'm not talking to that, uh, you can think about the scenographic um, aspects of the project, the sort of like representational lens of, of the things that I think about and work on, um, which tie back to artwork um, and looking looking at works in the, in the Kemper certainly um, and across the history of architecture and art um, as governing like a second set of decisions, the sort of like civic cultural, like how do we make better space in cities um, that 
is is dealing with disciplinary problems at the same, you know, like it's a it's a fine line. So I I I think like tuning the tuning the conversation to whichever audience uh, at the moment um, is something that that I, I I try to be able to do to sort of like bob and weave and figure out how to <laughs> uh, yeah. how to talk about it in different ways. Um, and so the sort of, oh, what is machine vision? What does that mean to architecture? And like, how could we understand the way that machines see and produce these like unusual textures that the car would be responsive to? Like that gets into this like really fine grain detail that I think is, um, is sometimes like a more a strange level. Like, oh, could we get rid of street signage and, and have sign sort of patterns uh, painted on the street or textures on the street that the car responds to. Um, those things I think are going to be, you know, really possibly very interesting and, and fun outcomes. Um, and yet there are things that slip, slip through this sort of broader uh, focus. But I don't know, did I answer your question? Um, to some yeah. extent, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I, I guess, let's say, here's an example, I think, I think what might, I think you're on the right track in the sense that what might be the basis for the architect to establish autonomy is precisely by sensing these problem points and responding to them. Um, and maybe not only by just knowing that you're speaking to different audiences, but also, for example, you mentioned the case in which, um, the, the scenario in which an autonomous mobility uh, network sort of picked up someone and took them to mass transportation. Um, and on the one hand, yes, that does sort of make it possible to live farther away, but it does then meet, presuppose that that person has the means to command the autonomous vehicle, whether that's money or um, technical savoir faire. Um, so there is the sort of edge there. So then it's an example of maybe a place where an architect could um, could decide how transparent to be about that edge, you know, or, um, it, but it, I don't know the answer, but it seems like maintaining awareness of the, the sort of parameters and the limits of the aspects of the system might might be a kind of, the key to the architect not simply becoming the sort of apologist and facilitator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's, well, I guess, but, yeah, Ted, you, you first, I'm still formulating a, a response or thought. Keep so talking. To go back to the artworks, I know it's, I love talking to you about these issues because we are, have such a different point of view and there's always a kind of like, um, productive tension there. Um, but the artworks, <laughs> enough of us talking about our usual um, <laughs> conversation. Let's talk about the art. Um, one thing that strikes me though about the artworks is that they are kind of purposeless, right? So the artists didn't generally aren't being pragmatic. I mean, there, there was that phase where artists were involved in like developing camouflage for British battleships in World War II and like artists are sometimes doing practical things. But it's interesting to me that you're drawn to these artworks, um, that they should be like a sort of lodestone for you because they are, because because you're so actually immersed in the practical and they are so, um, they seem so indifferent to practical concerns. What do you make of that? Oh, I hate that I'm immersed in the practical. It's really, I'm kicking myself. <laughs> Maybe I'm mischaracterizing you, but that's what I, that's what I'm hearing. Like you're so, you're so good. Like you're so conscientious about all aspects of what needs to be taken care of and all the problems that need to be solved. <laughs> um, well, okay. So I think arts is a, a super uh, important and relevant part of, uh, I, I don't I don't undertake architecture like no studio no uh, course that I've ever taught has not integrated art to a certain extent in the uh, proceeding through the semester like at 
some point we look at artworks, uh, you know, through a lecture and discussion, through something, uh, whether it's then informing some kind of exercise in the class or not. Um, in this case, uh, in the studio that runs parallel with the teaching gallery, all of the students made, I should have brought them to show, um, all of the students made animations uh, in relation to the artworks that they looked at in the gallery. Um, <clears throat> and where those uh, really, I think, um, are helpful is like setting up some kind of uh, cr critical discussion uh, for the for the students. Um, certainly, the the artworks there are a number of uh, conceptual artworks. Um, certainly, Rache fits in that category to a certain extent. Um, that you know, they're they're. Uh, useful not only in revealing a particular set of concerns or um, aspects of things to look at. So we can think of, you know, Roche looking at these uh, mammoth parking lots and we can be more literal um, about it and understand, oh yeah, the parking lot, you know, look at how much parking lot there is in Los Angeles. Like, wow, that's a lot of parking lot. Um, and think about, you know, is that really, <laughs> the right uh, answer to a parking scenario um, as they as the students work on their studio project. Um, at the same time, we can look at Ruche and see uh, the way that he moves through representation, um, both this kind of uh, deadpan or um, uh, sort of dry um, delivery, this kind of like hand, hands off, I don't know, uh, and, and literally in some sense, because of course he's commissioning a photographer to take the photos um, and produce this typology or index. So, you know, how does that then inform the way that the uh, projects are represented that have worked with that as a kind of precedent for their projects? Um, and to me, representation is, is paramount in architecture that uh, we, you know, to quote Robin Evans, uh, as architects, we don't make buildings, we make drawings of buildings or images or models. Um, I would posit more as a more contemporary spin on that. Um, and certainly Evans talked about images as well. Um, but that, that sort of process of making images um, is something that has major implications on the projections, you know, like if, if those images are to materialize then as, as buildings down the road, uh, they will have contributed uh, monumentally to whatever that building will be. Um, so while we don't realize buildings in studio, we, I think are really like working, uh, at a great uh, level of focus on the production of images and what kinds of images might um, push building further um, and create kind of new, I, I do think the creation of novelty is, is a part of that, like how can we invent through representation um, and, and realize things that we might not otherwise if we, um, we're operating sort of understanding representation as less generative, um, uh, one wouldn't get to that. Um, so I, I think that's, that's why the artworks play uh, to me a pivotal role because they work within conceptual structures, they raise uh, problems, um, and they also, and, and not in a didactic sense, right? It's not like this is clearly, you know, there's like, you could sort of tease out of any artwork um, a number of conversations or uh, discussions. And, and so they really fuel that um, critical discussion uh, and interplay that you're, then discussing with them through representations, uh, even in their absence. Um, so it's bringing all of those artists to speak really to, to the students <laughs> through their projects in the course. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think as you, you, I think you put that really beautifully. And I also think that, that you're right, that there's a tremendous potential in architecture through the creation of images to kind of create these like open 
representations that allow people to engage and, but don't force them to any particular point of view. I'm trying to think of whether there's a building I can think of, like an architectural work that um, that was inspired by the car or that speaks to the car. Mm. And I feel like there must be one, but I'm gonna keep thinking about that. <laughs> In yeah. the meantime, um, I thought I would pick up on a couple of questions that have come up in the Q and A. Um, one is, do you think that the classic car culture will be changed with the, with the advent of autonomous vehicles? Will the great American road trip change or will it even still exist? And what will happen to documentations of car culture such as postcards and so forth? Oh, great question. Um, I think that car culture will sustain in spite of the fact that if, if we had 100%, you know, if the individual car ownership goes away, if self-driving goes away entirely, of course, uh, that would really problem, you know, make a problem for, for those things and, and how would they survive. Um, but it's pretty clear to me um, that we'll always have, a, a, you know, this is like guessing down a road that you can't guess entirely. But if I were to make any uh, bets, I think it's pretty safe to say that we'll continue to have a hybrid system um, that will have autonomous vehicles, but it will never be 100% autonomous vehicles on the road, even though that percentage will increase um, greatly. So the sustaining of, I mean, you know, how long have people uh, talked about books being killed or, or uh, <laughs> newspapers and magazines being killed by the internet uh, or by digital um, productions of, of, you know, audio or uh, not audiobooks, um, ebooks. And it just, it, it will never happen. I mean, books are wonderful things, uh, amazing things in their own right. And they have their own capabilities. Uh, you know, cars are a technology that um, can exist in tandem with. So I don't think we'll see them like eight tracks. Uh, they won't just disappear. <laughs> eight tracks. <laughs> yeah, I don't see any eight tracks around, but I see books. I have lots of them littering this place. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, and and that said, uh, you know, postcards. I think I think we also like. I guess postcards fall into the same category as as books. They are marvelous little treats that you can send sometimes. You uh, can, you know, but I think they're dead. I, I so. And I say that as an ardent fan of the postcard. The last time I I was. Um, traveling I I bought a postcard but it was so hard to figure out how to buy a stamp that I was just completely stymied and, and then I brought the stamp and then I just didn't get to a mailbox so I came home with this Italian stamp and a postcard and I next time I go to Italy maybe I'll send the postcard <laughs> I mean, you need to send it to somebody in Italy from America <laughs> oh maybe <laughs> But I mean, that seems like a whole other conversation. Like, is, what is the status of the postcard in the age of Instagram and um, mm -hmm. the internet? And um, yeah, yeah, no, fair. That's it. Does seem like it is not the uh, speediest of tasks. Um, speaking of speed, uh, like both the sort of getting to the position to be able to send it and the traveling of it thereafter. I mean, it might be a month before the postcard makes it where it's going internet. <laughs> Not to mention the dysfunctional post office. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, I thought of my three favorite car projects. Oh, good. So I'm gonna start with my very favorite one, which is Diller and Scofidia's Slow House. Because yeah. um, that's, I mean, the other ones I think of are the Villa Savoie where there's a sort of movement at the bottom, there's this place where the car is anticipated driving around the base yeah. of it. And then the Usonian house, like the, the Herbert Jacobs house that uh, my students and I looked at in the history, um, history of architectural history too this semester, where the, the facade that faces the street is essentially a garage and <laughs> like a blank solid wall, um, a carport. So um, Wright thought a lot about the car. But the slow house. It's so interesting you pick three domestic projects because I've been thinking so much, you know, we looked at precedents in the studio and they were all sort of like, because we're working on a transit hub, we looked at 
large transit based, um, but it is, it is this thing that like connects the city to the domestic space, right? Like it, it comes into your house with you. Um, those are great projects, man. So which ones did you look at? <laughs> we looked at, uh, let's see, we looked at, oh my gosh, it's gonna challenge me to remember. No, <laughs> that's okay. We looked what I loved Grand, about, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, Grand Central, we looked at like, uh, you know, Grand Central and um, Eros Cernan's, uh TWA terminal. So we looked at major transit, uh, even if it wasn't specifically car related. Um, mm -hmm. We looked at Herzog and Demeron's garage, Paul Rudolph's garage, Temple Street garage, which is one that I always love to park in myself. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Held, yeah, so, and UN Studios, uh, Mercedes-Benz Museum or BMW Belt um, by Coke Himmelblau. So trying to see these things that display cars, that move cars through their interior. Um, but yeah, those, those are, why didn't we try that scale too? Oh my gosh, I love it. Well, there's, there's also a project uh, drawn by Louis Kahn for Philadelphia, where he put these towers around the edges of the city, like parking towers. So the cars would come in and park, and then I guess you would get on the public trans transport. Mm -hmm. um, they would, they sort of look like um, Marina City. Like yeah, they, they would be like, we looked at. <laughs> yeah. But um, what I love about the slow house, among other things, is that it is, it's it's it sort of verges on the useless right because it's so the car for those who don't know it drives up to like a very narrow door with sla like <laughs> facade basically and then the house opens up as this curving cone basically toward the view of the sea and it's essentially a kind of armature for the, the architects unpack the idea of the house with a view and the idea of driving to your home from and getting out of your car and going into your house but they play around with these elements independently and um in a way that kind of breaks them out of the frame of the useful and the purposeful into just pure and like enjoyment in their case they seem to enjoy this like rigorous like marking out of the house um uh, well, as usual, I feel like I've learned so much talking to you, Chantel. <laughs> I've got all kinds of ideas for the next studio. Like, oh yeah, we will do, maybe we will do a house and we'll look at the car in the domestic and, oh my gosh. Yeah, the, the tie of the image really in Slow House, because they start with the image of a television screen as well. So pinning to that and the scenographic sort of the vista in the house. Um, which is, of course, like the windshield is just doing that as well. So yeah, and then there's the rear view mirror where you have, you know, where you just came from. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> well, um, is there anything else that you would like to talk about that I didn't ask you about? <laughs> no, I think yeah. we, I think we've, I think we've done it. We're at, we're at an hour. I want to go uh, celebrate as we all do, or some of us may not be celebrating. We can celebrate the end of uncertainty That's for it. sure. That's it. <laughs> or at least moving into the next stage of uncertainty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can celebrate whatever it is we can all celebrate. And, and maybe we can all get into the car and go for a little drive uh, for, for the fun of it, purposelessly. There you go. <laughs> Well, Constance and Chantel, thank you both for a really nice conversation. Um, and I appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Okay.